All right, hello everyone. I'm Sarah and I am a project manager and genetic counselor at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. I'll be talking today about the BabySeq project, which is a randomized trial exploring the use of genome sequencing in both healthy and sick newborns. But before I describe our plans for the BabySeq project, I wanted to first introduce some of our pilot data that got us to the point of being funded for the BabySeq project. So we started with a simple question, which is, are parents even interested in genome screening for their newborns? So we approached over 1,300 parents in the Well Newborn Nursery at Brigham and Women's Hospital within 72 hours after they give birth. And we, after consenting them, we randomized each family to receive one of two versions of a survey. The difference between the surveys was that one version included a five minute overview of genetics and genome screening. And then we asked parents to rate their interest in genome screening for their newborn if it were available as part of a research study for free. And they were asked to rate their interest on a five point Likert scale, which ranged from one not at all interested to five extremely interested. And the reason for this randomization is because we wanted to address concerns that even discussing genome screening or newborn screening with parents would raise their awareness of the state mandated newborn screening that goes on and would lead them to question or refuse newborn screening. Um, so then we followed up with parents several months later with another survey also asking them about their interests and some of these parents in the follow-up survey received mock results that gave them a better sense of what they could learn from genome screening. I'm actually not going to focus on the follow-up survey data, but stay tuned for that. It will be published soon. I'm going to primarily focus on our baseline data. So when we asked parents in the hospital how interested they would be in this test for their baby, we saw generally a high level of interest. So over 82% of parents were at least somewhat interested in genome screening for their baby. And we also um, checked with the clinical staff on the Well Newborn Nursery, and they reported that over the two-year period that we conducted this survey, not a single parent questioned or refused state-mandated newborn screening. So then our question was, can we find any associations between demographic characteristics of our sample and level of interest in genome screening? So those uh, analyses are shown here. So in the second column, you see the summary statistics. So our sample was, uh, 33 years old was the mean age, two-thirds of the parents who responded were mothers. Um, some ethnic and racial diversity, although largely white population, 80% were married. Very educated population, so 50% had at least some graduate school training. For half of parents, this was their first biological child. And these last two, uh, family history of genetic disease and infant health concerns, these questions were a bit vague in their self-reported data. So um, particularly for the infant health concerns, that these were all parents of well newborns. And so it was really their perception that there was some, some potential health concern with their newborn. So 6% of parents said yes. Um, we ran a logistic regression to see if there were associations between any of these variables and interest in genome screening. For that analysis, we dichotomized interest into not interested, which was those parents who said not at all or a little, versus interested, which was those who said somewhat very or extremely. And we saw that of these variables, um, parents who were married were slightly less likely to be interested in genome screening, and those who had some health concerns about their infant were less likely. And we can talk about in a discussion why that might be. There are some interesting hypotheses. We also were interested in how closely mothers and fathers would agree. So among our 514 parents who, who were asked this interest question, 168 of those were couples. And we defined having a similar level of interest as being within one point on the five point Likert scale. So 127 or about three quarters of parents were in that category where they generally agreed with our interest level and about 25% were discordant in their level of interest. And concordance was more likely for couples who were married. So some limitations of our pilot survey were that it was a simple survey just asking about hypothetical interests. Parents didn't actually have to make a choice about whether they wanted genome screening. Um, mothers and fathers in general were asked at the same time and generally in the same room, and we did explicitly ask them not to collaborate on their answers, but in some cases it happened anyway. Um, and while we did check with the clinical staff to make sure that no parents had refused newborn state newborn screening, we didn't track whether there was increased anxiety or confusion or questions about state, state screening. 
But despite these limitations, our data did suggest that parents can be asked about genome screening in the immediate postpartum period without threatening compliance on state newborn screening, and that there's a high level of interest among parents. So with these data and other data, we applied for and were awarded funding for the BabySeq project, which is a randomized trial that will explore the benefits and risks of genome, genome sequencing in both healthy and sick newborns. Our study was one of four that were funded by the NIH last year to look at this, the question of genome sequencing in newborns in different ways. And among those four projects, ours is the only one that will be offering sequencing to healthy newborns. So pending IRB approval, we plan to enroll 204, 240 healthy newborns at Brigham and Women's and 240 babies in the NICU at Boston Children's, as well as their parents and physicians. And this is an overview of what our study, uh, our study design. So we have built in a pre-enrollment genetic counseling session, which is basically a consent session that's very detailed and structured and will outline the potential benefits and risks and limitations of genome sequencing and the study design, the fact that it's a randomized design and parents may not actually receive genome sequencing for their baby. Parents who are then interested will be consented, will draw blood from the infant and both parents, and the genetic counselor will gather a detailed family history. And then the infants in both groups will be randomized. So all the infants will receive the standard of care state mandated newborn screening, the family history that the genetic counselor gathers, and half of babies in each arm will receive a genome report. So what that will include will be any pathogenic variants that are related to childhood onset conditions, carrier status for any childhood onset conditions, and a limited number of pharmacogenomic variants that could be useful in the childhood period. For those infants that have a phenotype, so primarily the infants in the NICU, their physicians will have the option of ordering an indication-based report, which is basically a targeted query of genes that are known to be associated with the infant's phenotype. The disclosure will be led by the, a study genetic counselor and study physician, and we're really structuring this to model clinical care as much as possible. So um, we want it to look like a clinical genetics consult. So um, the results disclosure led by the genetic counselor and study physician and the outcome or the summary of that disclosure as well as any recommendations and reports from the study will be sent to the infant's pediatrician and to any other physicians who have been involved in that infant's care. And the, that consult letter will be placed in the medical record. At 10 months after the disclosure session, the infant and parents will return for another uh, a visit that mimics a clinical visit with a study physician and genetic counselor, and again, the consult letter will be sent to the infant's physicians. We'll be doing a medical record review to look at healthcare utilization, tests and procedures that were ordered for these infants, and then throughout we'll be gathering outcomes, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, so we'll be administering surveys to both parents and physicians. And we also will have study physicians and genetic counselors available throughout the course of the study to answer questions from any parents or any physicians who are part of this study. So now focusing in on what the experience will be for infants and parents. So for infants born at Brigham or admitted to the uh, children's NICU, they'll be approached by an RA to give parents information about the study. If parents are interested, they'll have the pre-enrollment genetic counseling session and consent. Um, we'll survey them there, and then from that point forward, they have the option of contacting study physicians and genetic counselors at any point to ask questions. We have the results disclosure led by the, the GC and the study physician. The genetic counselor will also call parents one week after the results disclosure. Um, we see that primarily as a safety check-in um, to make sure that parents aren't distressed, but it's also an opportunity for collecting data, so we'll be administering measures of anxiety and um, postpartum depression. And at three months, they will receive a, another survey by mail or by email. And then at 10 months, they have their um, follow-up visit with the physician and genetic counselor, and we'll be surveying them at that point, too. So for physicians, we're going to try to survey as many physicians who might interact with these babies as possible up front. So that will include attending neonatologists, um, specialists who consult in the, in the NICU, and community pediatricians who tend to see a lot of infants that are born at Brigham or children's, admitted to children's. Um, and we'll be sending them a baseline survey, which is primarily to gather their attitudes about genome sequencing and their just out of the perceived utility of the test. We're not going to be formally consenting them, but rather they're completing the survey will serve as their consent. 
For each physician, they may end up not having any patients enroll in the study. They may have patients enroll and by chance all those patients are randomized to the standard of care arm, or they may have at least one, one infant in, under their care who is randomized to receive genome sequencing. So uh, at the point that any of their patients enroll, they can contact a study physician or a genetic counselor to ask questions about the study or about interpretation of results. Once one of their patients enrolls and we're prepared to return that patient's results to the family, we will remind the physician to, to please complete the baseline survey, so hopefully we'll have that data before they receive any results. Then after the results disclosure session to the family, the physicians will receive the consult letters from our study staff. And for any of the physicians who receive a genome report, each time they receive a genome report from the study, we will send them a utilization, a post-disclosure survey that asks them how they have used that information in the infant's care, how they plan to use that information in the infant's care. And again, we won't be formally consenting them, but their completion serves as their consent. At the end of the study, we will be surveying all of the physicians again um, in a survey similar to the baseline survey that get at, gets at their attitudes and their perception of genome sequencing and its utility overall. There's some sp specifics about our plans for surveying parents and physicians. These survey domains are subject to change, but in general, um, you can see here that the physician surveys are indicated in orange and the parents in black. So for Physicians, they'll be surveyed at baseline and end of study about their attitudes, perceived utility, and um, plans or actual utilization of genome sequencing results. And they'll also be surveyed once after every time that they receive a genome report. For parents, they'll be surveyed at baseline immediately post-disclosure three months and ten months later. And in addition to getting uh, their attitudes, perceived utility, and healthcare utilization will also be assessing their health behaviors and health intentions behav uh, and intentions. And we're really interested in family dynamics, so parent-child bonding, um, uh, partner relationships, and um, parents' distress. So this is the combined work of over 40 different investigators and wanted to acknowledge and thank them all. Thank you to Danielle Bach, who contributed some of these slides. Um, this is, the, I've presented our plans and um, we are really hoping that this will become a reality and we'll actually start implementing this study um, in late fall or early winter. So stay tuned uh, for more data and um, thank you all for your time. I have a question. Is this on? Um, so this is an incredibly detailed design, and having been involved in some of the ClinSeq studies as well, where we're trying to mimic clinical care as much as we can in a research setting, you're more in a clinical environment than we are, and take good care of patients, so your side arrow about having the availability of physicians and genetic counselors throughout, how do you balance um, it's not even balanced. How do you account for what might change your outcome? So if you find a subset or even a majority of people who have more negative attitudes in the end and are more distressed, what do we attribute that to? I mean, how do you go back and say it was the information they received, it was how they received it, it was what the people in the NICU said to them? How do you, how do you tease that apart? That's a good question. I, I think we have, I, I suppose we have to think about what we can gather from our surveys or from interviews. And there's a limited amount that we can ask in the surveys. We may end up with some satisfaction questions which may or may not get at your, at your point. But we're hoping to build an option of interviewing parents too. Otherwise, I think it's really hard to tease out. And in, they might not even know. But what aspect is most distressing or concerning to them. Mm -hmm. it, it combines counseling, consent, sequence, results. I mean, it, it's a really complicated study, so it makes it hard in the end to know what we're really learning about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we're trying to take advantage of as many um, places where we can gather data as possible. So any time that parents contact a study genetic counselor or physician, we want to gather data on, on the content of that conversation. Um, and, and we don't yet have a structured, 
way of, or we haven't quite decided how we'll analyze all that or what the con you know, what form we'll use to gather that data and um, that is something, that definitely something to think about. Um, Deb? I'm not sure my comment is worth all of this. But <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really interested in this, and I understand the focus on how the parents are responding and your focus on that. It occurred to me that, and I know that you're going to have some survey data of the clinicians, the physicians that receive these letters of result. I thought um, it, uh, an interesting question occurred to me, and I'm sure it occurred to you guys, and I'm wondering if you could give us a sense of that discussion of the, uh, how the clinicians value the, uh, not just getting a report or having their patients receive these results, but getting the additional information to them from the genetic counselor um, describing or explaining what the mm -hmm. results are as part of your letter. So the question that occurred to me is, what is the added value to the pediatricians and others that are treating these patients that they're attributing to these letters? Um, within the context that we all think that, you know, clearly um, the focal point uh, around genetics information is spreading to non-genetic counselors and clinicians mm -hmm. and certainly primary care physicians who are going to have to help patients with this kind of information without, you know, letters from the genetic counselor. So tell me what you guys thought about that and where you think that question fits in this study. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great question as well. So we originally had envisioned this study to be more hands-off and um, to return, we would return results to the family, um, but we would be much more hands-off in sending that information to the pediatrician. So we had talked about, we'll just send the results to the pediatrician without that really a detailed accompanying letter, and we'll see what they do with it. And I, I think we came around to acknowledging that IRBs and others think that this is, this study's really rocking the boat, is really, really far out there and that we um, want to be sensitive to those concerns and um, and study and what we are more what we value more is studying how this information could be used in infants care and whether we have a more active hand in that uh, I think that's something that we just um, decided would be okay that we can take a more active hand and, and still draw conclusions about the utility of this information so um, it will be the way we have it designed where all physicians will get that detailed letter. We, we won't be able to tease out what's the added value of that, um, those detailed recommendations. We could look at um, ha which physicians choose to have an in-person or phone conversation with a genetic counselor and physician um, and, and you know, the content of those conversations might give us some additional information. We could look at how physicians interact with the study physicians and genetic counselors ad hoc by you know, inquiries. And, um, but I think we ultimately decided that it would be more pragmatic, I think, to, to take a more hands-on approach. Uh, uh, 